Uh, hello to all uh, in these uh, contrasting times. Uh, thank you for being with us today, really. As already said, uh, this crisis we are experiencing is perhaps an excellent opportunity to the path of uh, teaching. There is a saying that say, out of bad uh, comes good. So let's uh, take advantage of it. I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mathieu Olivier from the University Hospital of Marseille. Hi, everybody. Some, uh, of, who some of you already know. Dr. Olivier has a great deal of experience in knee alignment, notably with uh, Professor Sébastien Parat. As you know, uh, the success of an osteotomy lies in the precision of the plan correction. This is why uh, uh, Mathieu uh, was pioneer in the development of patient-specific instrumentation. At the end of the presentation, this, uh, at the end of the presentation, the session will be moderated by Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, that uh, some of you uh, already know, founder of the Pune Knee Osteotomy Meeting in India. There was a little teaser at the beginning of uh, of, uh, of this uh, webinar. Feel free to put your questions uh, in writing, and Dr. Tapasvi will establish a dialogue uh, between Matthew and all of you. Uh, I will uh, leave you in very good hands. Matthew, it's your turn. Thank you, everybody. So we'll try to start the PowerPoint now. Is it working? Yes, it is. Because it's a remote access PowerPoint thing. Um, no, no, no. No, no. Okay. Uh, let's start by the beginning. Huh? Okay. So uh, I think everybody see the, the first slide. So basically, uh, we'll try to talk about this uh, new philosophy surrounding uh, hip uh, knee osteotomy, femur, femur and tibia, but mostly by, we'll talk about tibia because I think that everybody here is doing mostly uh, tibial osteotomy. And uh, in, in my experience, I'm doing like 20% femur for 80% tibia. So I, I think it's, it's a good, good start to, 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 to talk about my experience on oste osteotomy on a tibia. Uh, I want to thank my co-author and my mentor in this uh, slide, uh, Sebastian Parat uh, teach me some, taught me some year ago uh, how to do osteotomy and I tried, uh, I will do my best uh, to please him in this, uh, uh, in this uh, few slides I will share because uh, he, he teach me a lot and I want to acknowledge that. Christian Clay was also one of my biggest uh, influence in, in my way to understand and, and perform osteotomy. And, um, and Adrian Wilson too, uh, was one of my uh, biggest influence in my last days uh, of learning of osteotomies. To be simple, I would say that uh, one of the key of uh, successful HTO uh, could be, could be, uh, uh, oh. vous voyez bien, Thibault? You, you see everything, you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, yes. Philippe, Philippe is saying that. Ouais, en fait, on voit comme si c'était sur l'écran de ton PC. Oh, okay, okay, so. Tu, um, tu lances le diapo. Please switch. Yeah, it's yes. not my computer. Uh, let's stop this here. And if we do it here. No, it's not working. It's like this. No, attends. Can you do this? Uh, right. Yes, yes, I can do that. Thank you. So let's, let's, uh, no, it's not working. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. okay, great. So the, the basics uh, of uh, a successful HTO for me will be first indication. And uh, I will try to give you some of my, uh, my tricks on that, but to be simple. And if there is only one message that you can uh, 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 learn from this uh, PowerPoint, it is that HTO or DFO only aim to, for one thing, and they aim for a correction of extraarticular deformity. Everything else, uh, meniscus, ACL, post-traumatic, uh, intraarticular problems will not be solved easily. So if you want to start doing HTO and if you want to improve your experience on that, start simple and start beginning with the basics of HTO DFO, which are correcting an extraarticular deformity. Then will come the planning and surgery. And I think we are here for that. Uh, how to simplify and to be very reproducible when you do a, an osteotomy uh, in a very easy manner. Um, okay, oh, I switch now. Okay, so um, let's imagine a, a, a very easy word. 
um, uh, where everything is static. Uh, I think uh, we, 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 th we thought about that uh, uh, a lot and, and most of us uh, were thinking for the last years that everything will be very easy to correct if we, we live in a, a single bone, which is a femur plus tibia, everything is, is a melt here. And uh, the idea is I have this 15 degree deformity and I will correct it very easily by just putting a wedge here, an opening or a closing wedge. And doing that, I will of course have a perfect alignment. This is a very static way of understanding. And if you want to be the Harry Potter of, of osteotomy, you need to understand that it's more or less a dynamic concept where the femur can play a role. You can have a virus and a valgus and a femur too. The tibia will, of course, play a role. And then there is something in between, which is, which is the joint. And if you don't take into account this joint, you might have some, uh, some adverse outcomes. And if you want to be the Harry Potter of osteotomy, look at this GLCA, joint line congruency angle, that can solve most of the biggest issue of the postoperative outcome, outcome you will have, such as uh, uh, overcorrection of undercorrection uh, surrounding your osteotomies. Uh, this brings us to uh, oh, oh, what happened. So this brings us to to normality, and normality is not easy to define when you talk about osteotomy. And if you talk about this mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, everybody, maybe everybody listening, actually have some amount of valgus inside of his femur, three to four degrees, and everybody will also have four to five degrees of varus inside inside of their tibia. This is a normality. Everybody in the world get a normally aligned lower limb, which result of a small amount of valgus in the femur and a small amount of varus in the tibia. Knowing that, the good question is, what I'm supposed to correct if I'm starting with those two points, every tibia is in varus, every femur is in valgus. Uh, and of course you get this in between, the John line congruency angle, which is usually in between zero and two degrees, which will define what it's supposed to be inside of the joint. We have some laxities, we have some wear, and we have to take into account that this angle between the articular surface of the femur and the tibia is maybe one of the key points of osteotomies. And I think Christian uh, discussed a lot about that in his last talks here. Uh, we, we, we look at this and you can see that, once again, if I'm targeting for an HTO, there is nothing, nothing, that can make debates in between HTO or osteotomy. If you have mainly an extraarticular deformity, osteotomy will be the, the key point to solve it as its only aim is to correct an extraarticular deformity. If you have a very big amount of intraarticular deformity, shoot for something that will correct it, such as a UKA or a TKA or maybe nothing, but osteotomy will not solve easily intraarticular problem. And it is maybe one of the biggest issue when people send me x-rays with normal tibia, normal femur and big varus, which happen mainly in the joint. If you have that, try to do something as an osteotomy because it will not work easily. So to, to understand that, you need to analyze the global deformity, draw your angles, LDFA, MPTA, GLCA, know that you have some valgus in the, in the femur, some varus in the tibia. The, oh, the joint line is not completely uh, uh, at zero degree, but in between zero and two degree of orientation. And knowing that you will better, you have better outcome at the end of the day. Something else I would say in my practice, I rarely, rarely correct more than 10 degree inside of the tibia or femur. Because in my mind, I rarely face patient with very abnormal tibia in varus, for example, MPTA 78, or very abnormal valgus in a femur, for example, uh, LDFA 18. This rarely happened to me. So as I'm trying to correct something to return back to normal and not to something very abnormal in terms of uh, uh, anatomy, I'm, I'm rarely correcting that. Then how to do that? I think Christian covered this point. This is a miniature technique correction. Uh, there is tons of way to doing this. And I think if you want to uh, to return back to your book and your drawing boards, uh, there is a perfectly done paper on KSSTA and KESTA made by Adrian Wilson and Matt Dawson on Miniachi technique. I think uh, I learned a lot about this uh, just reading this paper. Everything is very easy to understand if you want to go to that. And then, uh, as uh, you know, I'm, I'm locked down with my kids, so I got not so many uh, tools to, to, to play with. 
I got papers, I got pens, and I got rulers, and I'll try to make you understand a crucial point uh, to start with PSI. The global ID is, this is my uh, varus tibia and valgus femur thing. Uh, I, I enjoy my mucolytic line, which will cross at the normal MAD of six to eight millimeters, so in medial compared to the spines. And then the idea is to try to, to move this mucolytic line and move my ankle to somewhere where the load bearing will happen here. This is the Fujizawa zone, 65 to 70. This is the noise and ductal point, 62.5. This is where I'm playing actually. I'm trying to be at 55 on lateral spine to not to overcorrect the tibia if I'm doing a tibial correction, for example. And doing that, this is what I'm done with a Caesar with my kids, my kids Caesar. So I, I'm going to try to reproduce a correction, which is the pre-op position of the ankle, the ideal position of the ankle with a load weight-bearing line passing in a lateral spine. This is my alpha angle in between my pre-op and posterior position of my ankle reported to my hinge. And I'm doing my openings. And as you can see here, the correction is perfect. So, I mean, everything is deeply aligned. But what happened then is that my tibia is deeply in valgus. And if you, very, if you look to the beginning, the, ear, the, the mistake here was that my femur was in cause. So I should have done all the measurement prior to correct my deformity and understand that the problem was in the femur. And we have this nice uh, 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 scientist actually called Donald Trump that just said like 15 years ago that you cannot let the curse, the cure be worse than the problem itself. And I think it's the same thing for osteotomy. If you want to correct, correct the good bone. Uh, try not to overcorrect the tibia into a, a morphology, which is not very common in the, in the nature, such as a valgus tibia of MPTA 94, 95. Try to reproduce something which is close to the normal anatomy. And I think patients will be better with that. Let's talk about uh, PSI now. So the global ID is we, we don't have many, many tools to play with. I think there is a video here. Uh, yeah, so we don't have many, many tools to play with. One of these is where I'm supposed to start my cutting. So I decide to do my osteotomy here. I will stop this video for a second. Um, I, was, I, I decide to do an osteotomy to this tibia to do a, a sewing process here, to do an opening here to correct this metaphysical uh, tibial deformity. And then the question is where I'm supposed to start, where my sew is supposed to be at the beginning. And, and you can see here that it's, it's a good question, but basically it's changed nearly nothing. You can start your sewing process here or here, as long as your hitch point is the same or, or, or your hinge point is not moving too much, the correction will be the same. You can see on this uh, small shooting that moving my hinge up and down will not change a lot the correction I'm proposed to do because to have a one degree difference, I need to move more than six centimeters above or below my hinge point. So if you are do a wrong entrance point or a too high or too low hinge, the correction will not change. What will change is the high risk of hinge fractures such as Takeshi one, uh, lateral cortice uh, breakage for Takeshi one above the femoral head or below the tibio fibula joint uh, for the Takeshi two. Those two uh, inch fractures are very common, 20-25% of the cases if you look to the literature. There is several ways to avoid them and we'll discuss that later. Um, the other question is where I'm supposed to start my cut as compared to the mechanical axis of the tibia. And if you think about it, uh, you don't want to do that. This uh, ascending cut will probably end with a very abnormal tibial slope, which is not good. So I will say that try, the ideal cut should be completely parallel to the, tibials, to the tibial plateau and probably perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia. And then you are in a good position to have an unchanged slope at the end. Because if you do a cut like this, probably this will deeply influence the position the, the slope that you create, inserting a, a, a hinge, a wedge at the anterior part or the distal part of the tibia, uh, creating an anomaly of the tibial slope. Same thing goes for the hinge position. It's not so easy to understand, but if you move your hinge uh, anterior to posterior like this, so my hinge, the hinge is like a, a, a just a, 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 a fixed point where your tibia is opening around. If you move your hinge anterior to posterior here, you will change this slope from 
plus six to minus six degree very easily and uh, and probably this will not be a good so, uh, this will not provide good outcome to your patient if you're changing your slope by plus or minus six degree just moving your hinge from anterior to posterior this inch position point is a very crucial point to have good outcome uh, after osteotomy and you can see also that and we just discussed that that this hinge the hinge need to be unscattered if you don't want to have adverse outcome uh, the global idea is there is true, three types of fracture defined by Takeshi. The first one is going through the lateral cortex. The second one is getting below the tibiofibular joint. And the third one is ascending into the tibia. Let's, 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 let's solve the problem of, of the type 3, which is here on the x-rays. It's always patient where you didn't, do not cut enough the posterior cortices and you try to open them by forcing the, the, the valgus movement of the distal tibia. If you do that with an intact posterior cortex here, of course, you will have a breakage inside of the joint because the, the, the strength of the bone on the metaphysis is lower than the strength of the bone on the tibiofibular joint. So knowing that, if you're not cutting completely the posterior aspect of the tibia, you might have risk to have those Takashi like free fractures that are directly related to a surgical mistakes. Then come the type two and type one. Type two is this one. Uh, it's very bothering because most of the time you will discover them at your uh, post-op uh, appointment at two or three months. And those guys, the Takashi two, uh, two uh, fracture lead to uh, uh, non-unions and you need to avoid weight bearing on that because it's creating a sliding surface where the upper and the distal tibia can slide and create some non-unions. The Takashi one fracture are very common. Uh, to be honest, I'm not taking them into very big account. And when I have a Takashi one fracture, I'm, I'm just leaving them like that and, and doing full weight bearing on that. And probably it will, uh, the, the, the speed of healing will decrease, but it will not change a lot of the outcomes. If you have a Takashi two fracture and you have the luck to discover it inside of the OR, you need to fix it because the rate of non-union is very high. So knowing that, uh, put a screw here, distal, proximal to distal, or just a staple around, and it will help the patient to in, this, in the in the osteotomy side to heal uh, more uh, in a more accurate and more faster way than if you leave this sliding uh, uh, phenomenon happen because nothing still uh, attaching the proximal tibia to the distal, even the tibiofibular joint is lost in this kind type of fracture. Um, what would be good if I could would have if I want to speed up my osteotomies and, and, and when we thought about the PSI concept, one of the idea was uh, I'm, I'm, I want to know where to put my plate on and what will be the size of my screws. And one of the good thing of PSI is everything will be ready for you. And uh, as we are do 3D planning and we are uh, doing some virtual osteotomy, just like on this uh, on this picture, you will see that probably you will be able to know all the size of the screws as long as you're able to put the plate on a good position. The second good point is this hinge key wire. I think it is probably one of the biggest improvement on my osteotomy technique with the posterior retractor concepts of Christian and Adrian Wilson, uh, which probably is the, the biggest idea to avoid hinge fractures. If you still, if you have this key wire in position, first, it will stop your sewing process. Second, it will put the hinge at the good position because your blade can go more anterior and more posterior, but probably not through the, the key wire, except if you cut it, but it's probably not a good solution. And it will take time with your sew to cut through a key wire. And secondly, it will help you to increase the, the resistance of the hinge to fracture when you perform your opening. How to do a PSI? And I think it's uh, everybody is here to, to learn about that. Uh, this is my pre-op planning for a patient. So uh, I'm, I'm measure my MPTA, it's an 82. I want to go to a 90, which is to me a nice correction. So it's an eight degree correction. I don't want to change the slope. This is why I'm sending to new clip with the, with the CD scan. And then we are uh, practicing some uh, 3D mapping of the femur. And we try to say, okay, so this is the global aspect of the proximal tibia. This is where the cut is supposed to be with 110 degree here, which is the rule from Mignacci, 110 degree. And this uh, cut position will be 
uh, support by a key wire to avoid any uh, uh, MISO to get uh, below and go more distal when I cut. So there will be a first key wire that will be here position on my cutting guide. Second, this is my cutting guide and this is how it works. The global ID is I get my first key wire to, to, to get my, my cut. I get a, a, slow, a, um, a slot to get my, 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 my saw through the bone and through uh, the PSI. And I get a second key wire. We decide, we discussed that already. That will be here, and we will protect the hinge from cutting. And enhance is res is resistant to fracture during the opening. Then we get holes, eight holes or, or six holes, based on the plate you want to use. This is a eight hole plate, and um, I will do some eight holes here. And those eight holes will be pretty different as compared to the what what is super what, what I'm doing drilling inside of the plate and when, it, when I was drilling inside of my PSI. And this match of one or two, cent of one or two centimeters here will be the correction. The global ID is, cut the microphone, please. Everybody, it's easier. Carlos, cut the microphone. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. So the idea is um, I'm doing uh, uh, eight holes or six holes, and it, there will be a mismatch on the medial side of my tibia. And if you can see that, the difference will be the difference in between the hole I, dr I drilled uh, with my PSI and the hole on the top of my plate is the correction. So everything is integrated in between this geography on my PSI and the geography we know on the plate. The difference is the correction. Is it accurate? First, good question. So I think we 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 done quite uh, some studies in vitro first, and we we found that the, that in this in vitro study the difference will be one degree in terms of MPTA and PPTA. Uh, we do also some in vivo studies, and if you look to the in vivo study, you will see that uh, uh, we have a difference which was uh, uh, mostly it's here 0 0.9 on mpta and 0 0.9 on, on uh, ppta and for the first 10 patients with a ct scan matching pre-op to post-op to understand what was the correction that we did we switched to our 100 first and in our 100 first uh, cases we have a two degree uh, difference for the hka plan but as you can but everybody know that as i discussed on the second slide HKA is not only connected to the tibia, but also to the femur and to the joint. This is why we have this mismatch, but since we focus only on the tibia, we have a one degree uh, accuracy on the MPTA and PPTA when we're using this cutting guide. Second question, is it safe? So we, in the same uh, 100 first, uh, we have uh, a, a very big amount of Takashi one fractures, where nearly 20% of them were fractured, Takashi one, and things, this was the time without this inch key wire. So we, we published a, a different study after this key wire. Uh, second, we have some issue with graft of cellulisis and cement persistence, which we completely abandoned and we switched to uh, 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 allograft only now, and we don't have any more any complication. We have an onion, and of course we remove some of the plates, mostly because of patient choice and very, very rarely because of medical indication. So yeah, it's safe. And is it easy? So we published with this, this is my, my resident crew, uh, and some of them are now my, now my fellow. We published a paper on the learning curve uh, on Kesta last year. And the global answer was after 10 cases, everybody switched, uh, the, the precision did not change from day zero to day 29, the, nine, the 29th uh, surgery. What changed was the timing. So we switched to almost 50 minutes to 25 minutes, uh, mean after 10 cases and the number of x-rays switched to uh, 15 to 20 x-rays to six after 20, uh, 25 uh, uh, use of the PSIs. This is a video showing how it works uh, uh, on a cadaver. We shoot that with Christian on the last uh, uh, new clip course in Nantes. Uh, globally, it's pretty, I will try to, to get to it. So the glo globally, the idea here, sorry, so to use the PSI, you're supposed to detach the, at least partially uh, the, the, the peasant serinus. Otherwise, there is no option to plug the PSIs in with enough precision. Then when, when this is done, 
you can uh, you can drive your PSI below the patella tendon here, and in posterior to the the MCL, which is retracted here. We release him slowly and we can put the two legs here. Um, and then when this is done, we have those uh, two key wires. You can see the MCL is still attached here. We just release it uh, from uh, the, the tibia, posterior aspect of the tibia. We insert this posterior retractor posterior to the MCL to protect the vessels and to be in between the tibia and the, and the, the propitous muscle. And then we put two key wires one is uh, the, the first one will help to drive the slow. The second one will protect the key wire. So the first one will, we will help to drive the slow. And then uh, we'll put a second one to protect the hinge. Those two key wire are very important too because you will see them on the, on the, on the fluoroscopic control here with those two direction being uh, marked on the pre-op uh, virtual osteotomy. And then you will have them on the X-ray that you will shoot when everything is ready. We have the X-ray in a few seconds. Um, and you can compare the planning that was done on a virtual CD scan to what happened on your, I, I will try to slow down a little bit just to, to explain to you. So you can, you can see here that you have, you will have this image here. Yeah, this image here, okay which is on, on the, I will succeed, I promise. One, two, okay. This image here uh, show you what was on the CD scan and what happened on the, on the, on the cadaver. So you need to rotate the limb exactly the same manner to have a complete uh, uh, overlap of the two images in your head. And when you're happy with that, you can move to uh, the fixation of the PSI. So we are drilling the holes. Those holes will be the final holes on the plate, but also help you to secure the PSI on the tibial bone. So we are drilling six proximal and six distal in this case of uh, this cadaver setting uh, with the small plate. When this is ready, uh, we, we are drilling the first the proximal one because it's the more uh, mobile part of the guide than the distal one, which is rigidly fixed. When everything is ready, we, are, we will do the sewing process and the sewing process uh, will start only cutting the first cortice, the major one, and the, the will be finalized after the PSI is removed completely to be completely sure that we cut everything. So we cut the first, the major cortice, we remove the proximal part of the guide, hold the key wire can be left in place if possible, otherwise the sewing one uh, can be removed if not possible. And you can see here that we take a good, good, uh, we take a good attention of cutting the posture aspect of the tibia because otherwise, during the opening, everything is exploding. If you need, if you need it, and if you want it, you do an ascending uh, biplanar cut to, to avoid any movement of your patella and to, to elevate the proximal metaphysis without um, without uh, moving the patella up and down. And then the good, we remove everything. You can see here that the holes are here. I will mark them with a marker uh, here uh, uh, to all um, with these big blunts, uh, which are uh, uh, smooth. Uh, to uh, the position of those holes. It's very important because when you put your plates inside, you, it's not so easy to see where the hole were. So be, it's very important to mark them. And then I'm opening with some chisel. Uh, uh, this is uh, the classic chisel from, uh, from the German school. And uh, we are opening slowly and slowly, increasing the size and the triangle created by those chisel uh, uh, very slowly. The intended correction was an eight degree, so it's not a big correction. So I'm slightly and slightly opening, then uh, creating, uh, maintaining my, my osteotomy gap with this anterior wedge, and then putting my Mary retractor posterior to the MCL. I will, uh, sorry, posterior to the MCL here. The MCL is here, my Mary retractor is here. The opening is maintained by my Mary retractor, my uh, laminar spreader. And I'm opening slowly and slowly until my holes are facing. And then the correction is done. And the only thing left uh, is by crossing the MCL, if you still, you feel it's too tense and uh, put back the peasant serinus on the plate or below the plate or wherever you want to put them. 
Uh, this is for the videos. Um, this is in vivo because it's happening. You can see that uh, I'm marking my scar uh, to be exactly the size of the PSI because otherwise uh, uh, you get not enough room. But my scar is exactly the same size. This is a closing wedge uh, uh, tibia for a valgus tibia. Then I'm opening, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to dissect my MCL to protect it. Then you can see here, I got one posterior retractor behind the MCL and one small uh, Hohmann retractor to protect it from the sewing process anterior to the MCL. This is probably the only way to have this Hohmann retractor here to protect the vessel. And you will uh, hear it, I think, in a few seconds. Um, so we have, I don't know if you can hear, if we hear, not really. But the global ID is uh, I'm putting my Hohmann retractor here, posterior to the MCL. So I got a nice, a way to go posterior to the MCL, anterior to the popliteus muscle, and uh, protecting my vessel uh, uh, in between the popliteus muscle and the arctic in the the bone, the posterior bone surface. Then everything is done, and I can cut without a big hesitation, and I can really cut deep and uh, and and go completely to the posterior aspect of my tibia. Um, I'll try to move it a little bit. Yeah. So take on messages for these slides. Uh, I would say, sorry, it's in, most of them are in French. I'm very sorry for that. But globally, whatever the system you use, navigation, robots, PSI, whatever, it's only helping your hand. And I will say that the, your biggest friend in osteotomy is your head. Planify, do nice planification, try to understand where the deformity is, how to correct it, how to be sure that the correction will be the one you, you desire at the, before the surgery will give you better outcome than any precision device. Message one, it's only helping your hand. Second, it's a very easy tool, and I think it's maybe why it's spreading all around the world very fastly. It's easy to use, and there is no way back. When you start with PSI, you will say, oh my God, I, 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 I struggled for years doing osteotomies, and this sim system is so simple to use that I don't know how I, I, I just, it, it just changed my life. It's very economical, it's, it's very easy to understand. The price is not so high and it will help you to decrease your timing by 20, 25 minutes, which is in France about 1,000 to 2,000 euros in terms of economy. If you're, you, if you're able to put one or two patients more in your schedule, every one or two patients because uh, you're, you're decreasing your timing by 20 minutes. And then it's, a, it's more than a patient-specific system. It's a surgeon-specific system. And, uh, here, you get, uh, and here you get uh, some of the crazy cases. Uh, I, I, always, uh, I always try to show crazy. It's not the, the cases where you're supposed to start with. But this is an intraticular Shiba osteotomy. Uh, with a cutting guide. So we, we designed this with uh, Philippe Berton, which is the chief engineer from Euclid. And we also have those, uh, one of the most uh, crazy cases of the last years, uh, derotation plus closing osteotomy, uh, uh, intraarticular post-traumatic osteotomy, uh, osteotomy plus meniscus transplant with two tunnels connected to the PSI, uh, uh, slope changing osteotomy, uh, slope changing osteotomy for a reverse slope, Shiba osteotomy, the rotational osteotomy, whatever you want to do, they can do it for you. But first, you head need to understand what you're supposed to do. And then this system will only bring your hand to the higher level of accuracy and precision. Uh, we publish tons of paper on the subject, and I think most of them are easy to find now with uh, SciHub and this kind of thing. Uh, and I think it's my last slide, and I want to thank you. Uh, uh, for, for your attention. I will close this by uh, uh, one, my, uh, one of my last case uh, that always uh, uh, intriguing everybody. Uh, just think about it. You got this uh, patient with, you, you aim to correct the intraarticular deformity, but if you look closely, everything is in a joint. The tibia is slightly in varus, 83 degree. The joint got eight degree of GLCA, which is a very abnormal uh, value, and the femur is normal. If you think about it, this is probably the only uh, complex cases in between uni compartmental neurotroplasty and osteotomy. But if you do an osteotomy, you will leave the joint uh, uh, with an ILBAC4 uh, bone on bone disease, will probably end up with bad results. If you only treat the joint, you will end up with a, a UKA on a very big virus and probably a failure of the implant 
in the next, in the following two, three, or probably five years. Finally, uh, for those patients with very complex thing, go to go to easy. Try to correct the joint. Try to correct the bone. And if you are after few PSA osteotomy, you probably want to say, okay, I would do, an, I would give him a normal tibia and a normal joint. And this is why I done for this guy uh, some uh, uh, two months ago, and this guy is doing very well. So the idea is we just correct everything step by step, and the things uh, are going better if you understand where the problem are. Thank you for attention, and uh, now I'm open to question. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. I think that was a great uh, presentation uh, and uh, you've rightly brought out all the principles of uh, how to correct essentially what are the principles of correction and uh, how do you achieve them very easily with the help of PSI. So we have a lot of questions coming through and I'm going to be asking them one by one. The first question is that uh, how do you tackle the MCL? Do you release it? Do you cut it? What do you do to the superficial MCL? What do you do to the deep MCL? Can you hear me? It's okay? Yes. Because yes. Uh, absolutely perfect, yeah. So the, the global idea is, so uh, uh, everything you, you saw in the last slides were the first, uh, uh, the first design of my PSI, because I say mine, because it's once again surgeon specific, and I switched to something without the two posture brackets, so it's only a, a big plug I, can, I, I, I might have show you. So uh, it's now a monoblock one with only two screws proximal, two screws distal, the two key wires, but no more brackets. So I'm piloting this cutting guide on my uh, medial surface and I'm not releasing anything anymore. Even the hamstring I still attach at the end. It's very small, but to be able to do that, I've done more than 200, 250 PSI to understand exactly how it works. So this is the biggest, probably the biggest problem of PSI. First, it's size, it's a seven to eight centimeter block. So you need to have a big incision. Second, to be efficient, it needs to be fixed on the tibia in a very accurate manner. And to do that at the beginning, you need to release the superficial MCL completely. Try to leave the posture, the, the deep MCL like you saw on the, on the video uh, attach at the posterior aspect, but you need to release it completely too. And finally, the hamstring, the, the patient's awareness need to be completely detached and reattached at the end of the surgery. Okay, so I think there's another question on the same, uh, so, or sort of on the same event, is that how many times with your first generation PSIs did you have a problem of matching the PSI with the bone? So, you know, you're working through a limited space and you really need to get that anterior fin underneath the tendon and the posterior fin on the back of the tibia. So what percentage of time will you find that there's a mismatch or you start struggling to get it perfectly bang onto the bone? I would say uh, maybe uh, on, my, on my learning curve, I would say maybe one case on three or four. Uh, okay. yeah, it happened to me, that's true. Then you need to understand the, 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 the overall concept. The correction is integrated inside of the system. Yeah. So if, you, if your PSI is too high or too low, the only thing that you're risking is probably a hinge fracture. Then come the question of the rotation of the PSI. If you rotate it too much, you are changing your slope. So the, the real thing is to be able to reproduce a hinge, a key, a key wire position, which is deeply the same. This will allow you to know that your rotation of the PSI is good. Then so, come to, into question, if I'm too high or too low, I would say I'm tolerating two to three millimeter too high or too low. Okay, so on the same note, if I ask you, is there any intraoperative check that you can sort of do maybe you know, maybe I make an x-ray with the KY ring, which tells you that yes, you have validated your PSI position, similar to what we do say when you're doing navigation, you always have to validate the exact position of your guide. So what is the interoperative trick that you will use for the same? I would say, so x-ray, of course, with the two key wires inside after a careful 
uh, a verification of the rotation of the knee that need to be exactly, exactly the same that you, your pre-op CT scan, uh, uh, virtual 3D mapping. This is point one. Second, the, the, the height of the PSI as compared to the joint line is also gave, is also uh, uh, provided by new clip. So I'm using a key wire and I put it like nearly on touching the higher spot of the, of the joint, nearly the meniscus. And I, I'm seeing, I, I am on the same X-ray, an idea of where am I in terms of height compared to the proximal tibia. And finally, which is, which is also a good point, you can put your saw blade in, in, this, in the slot to see that you only see a thin line, which means that you're almost parallel to the, or almost perpendicular to the tibial mechanical axis. If you are seeing your saw blade with, uh, with like, like a, a square, something is wrong in terms of rotational position. And it's exactly the same thing when you use any kind of cutting uh, slot, uh, you need to ensure that the rotation is good. Otherwise, you can end up with an X-ray, like I showed uh, on my slides, with a cut which is 45 degree compared to the mechanical axis of the tibia, which is a disaster for the slope. So, you know, there's another very good thing which the new clip system gives you, is that they can also give you the bone morph model. You know, so they can also give you the bone uh, along with your PSI, the bone model as well. So for what would be your suggestions to people who are starting to use PSI for how many cases, maybe first 10, 15, 20 cases, should they actually order in the bone model as well, which will help them understand where exactly the PSI sits? I would say, uh, I, I remember a question from, from Ronald Van Leeuwarden some years ago, and, and he told me, what happened if the PSI is falling on the floor during the, <laughs> the, during the surgery? And I said, they can print two of them. <laughs> so I would say, if you, have the, if, you are, if you are still anxious, try to have it all the time. And, uh, and, 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 I, can, and I can remember my boss, he is doing a lot of PAOs and he still watch, he still have a, a, a form model of the pelvis in the room and he's doing 50 a year. So, I mean, if you're anxious, do it all the time. They will probably charge it. I'm sorry, Greg, I, I can saw you. <laughs> they will probably charge it, but I mean, it's not so expensive and, and, and it's worth it. If you want to have it, it's worth it. Okay, so when we're doing these, uh, when we're sending in your CT scans, do you want to talk about what sort of CT scan should we send in? Because, you know, you calculating all your angles on weight bearing X-rays. So can we get a supine CT scan or should we have standing CT scans? And can we do all these, uh, can we do the PSI models on X-rays? Good question. So the answer is actually no. Uh, uh, things are evolving and I think, uh, uh, EOS systems, MRI probably will be the next steps for PSI designing. Uh, what we have today is the correction to be provided by the surgeon should be measured on weight bearing x-rays. Then if you think about it in between MPTA, LDFA, there is no difference in between CD scan, weight bearing, non-weight bearing or whatever, because it's still a bone. The only problem you can have is rotation. And for that, 3D planning is better than CD, uh, is tunnel X-rays. So that will say, you need to understand which correction to promote and to provide uh, uh, and send this to Nucleus with the CT scan saying, I want to do a 10 degree correction on my NPTA because I do my Miniachi or my, uh, 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 my classic uh, femoral mechanical axis and tibial mechanical axis correction. And then the only thing you have is the CT scan just will help, would be an help to do the virtual osteotomy, but we are not planning anything on the CT scan. We are just creating a virtual osteotomy. Okay, so on the same note, I think if I take it one step ahead, how do you tackle uh, increased joint line convergence angle? So you've, uh, you know, you've made your measurements on a standing scanogram X-ray. You note now that the JLCA you know, you've got lateral opening, so your JLCA is maybe five degrees, but you've got a CT scan for planning. So how do you translate that increased JLCA 
your CT scan plan. Okay, so you want, I call a reporter, just as I said in my <laughs> second slide. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that GLCA is probably the biggest concern in my daily practice today. It's for me, first, very hard to understand and completely unpredictable. So what I'm doing, I'm following Christian and Lobanoffer and, and Ronald and your recommendation on that. And I'm trying to remove some of the, the GLCA from my, my, my intended correction. What happened, so I'll, I'll, I'm always doing stress X-ray, valgus and varus, but still I'm, I'm always removing some of my, of, my, of my correction. Why? Because in my experience, GLCA only creates overcorrection. And what I don't want to have is patient with an intended valgus at the end of the surgery. So what I'm doing, if I get, for example, a 10 degree uh, uh, a GLCA, which is very rare, let's imagine it's a seven or eight, I'm removing nearly half of it from the correction because I don't know what will happen. And uh, probably it will change nothing or potentially I will absorb this deformity correction inside of my osteotomy. So if I have an eighth GLCA, I'm removing three degree from my intended correction. And if I was aiming for a 10 degree correction, I'm switching to a, to a seven. So what will happen? First, I might have a normally aligned knee and not an overcorrected one, but what will never happen is a plus six or plus seven valgus correction at the end. And I think okay, it's that... the worst thing to happen for patients which are in virus for the last 40 years. Right. So that's a very nice point that you've got out. There are some technique specific questions uh, that have come up as well. So when you're doing a medial closing wedge tibial osteotomy for a valgus knee, so you're doing a medial closing wedge osteotomy, how do you apply axial compression? So how can you achieve axial compression when you're doing a medial closing wedge? Because the femoral plate has an oblong hole, but the tibial plate does not have an oblong hole. So I think you need to answer this in two parts. How do you apply axial compression? And the second part is, do you use the same plate that you use for a medial opening wedge osteotomy for a medial closing wedge osteotomy? That's a very good question because we all switch to uh, look at ang st 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 stable uh, angular plates. And uh, yes, there is no compressure to be done, performed. You cannot perform compression on nuclear uh, tibial plating. So what I'm doing usually is I'm removing my, uh, my, my wedge to close it. And then what I'm doing is I'm using my saw blade to cut nicely and completely everything. And I just ask my resident or my fellow to put an actual compression on the foot. And usually it's closing completely my osteotomy. What I, don't want to, what I don't want to happen is to, really, to leave some piece of bone inside of the osteotomy site that avoid me from closing the osteotomy site, which is supposed to close completely. We just remove two pieces of a triangle. And if you force it too much, what will happen? Either you, you're using a compression device or not, you will break the hinge. So I don't want this to happen. So I would say that closing wedge osteotomy femoral or tibial need a lot of softness and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a women's surgery, you know? It's, it needs to be very gentle. The bone is very fragile and, and you, you need to slowly and slowly cut everything to be able to, to, to have no problem with your hinge. Okay, another technique specific question is that, um, you know, with, uh, you know, a lot many times you need to perform an ACL reconstruction along with your pedial uh, open wedge osteotomy. So do you prefer to do them in a single stage with the PSI or do you think you're better off doing them in two stages? So what advantages will a surgeon get by with the help of the PSI and how will he be able to do a combined procedure uh, is what we need to understand. That's a very good point, Sashin. I, I would say that I've been doing, um, I'm doing probably 200 ACL a year and probably 80 osteotomy a year. Uh, both of them take, are taking me maybe 45 minutes to one hour. 
But when I'm making the two procedure in single stage, it's taking me two hours and 30 minutes. So I don't know where the time is lost, but it's a very, very complex scenario. So what, what PSI gave me, it's only one thing. I'm sure 100% that my ACL tunnel will not hit any screws because my ACL tunnel is connected to the plate in my PSI ACL tunnel. So this is why I'm doing this. And I will say it's not helping me from uh, uh, avoiding any stress because it's a stressing surgery. Second point, uh, uh, it's also helping me to have the tunnel entrance of my ACL at a good position to avoid any fracture, problem of fixation or whatever. And uh, you got two options. First one, the tunnel is crossing the osteotomy site. The second one, the tunnel is above the osteotomy site. And if you do above the osteotomy site, use a cortical fixation because your screw will be very short and you'll probably have no, no, uh, no good compressure uh, on, the, on the proximal metaphysis. And so it's, it's, it's helping me to understand what will be the main problem of, us, of my ACL postosteotomy. But actually in my practice, it's always a single stage surgery. So I would agree with the same. I think the use of the PSI makes life a lot more simpler. And I think the PSI really scores over the conventional approach because one is that as uh, Matthew really brought about, you can decide the position of the tunnel, you can avoid the screws. And for me, I think the most important aspect is that I can actually help and consistently decrease the slope, which is what you want to do when you're doing a combined uh, ACL reconstruction with an osteotomy. There's another question here uh, that's come up, is that what is the use of the lower wire in your PSI? Will it, how will it help a type three uh, hinge fracture? How, how I'm doing against type three hinge fracture, that's it? Yeah, how will the lower wire that we put how will it prevent a type three hinge fracture? It or can't. Will it, it or can't. Will it, or will it increase the chance of a type three hinge fracture? So because I you're will, putting this up, you know, is, is it going to weaken the cortex on the lateral tibial metaphysis, thereby leading to a higher incidence? Is that so the reason? And what can you sort of defend against that? It's a good question, Sachin. Uh, I saw the, the mechanical issue you can raising up here. I would say that if a fracture happens, it will probably follow the key wire because you already have a direction for this stress fracture. So probably it will end up uh, as a Takeshi one on higher, but not through the tibial plateau. And once again, I would say that Takeshi free fracture must be happen when you have an intact posterior cortice and probably happen because you're too shy during your cutting because you're anxious about the posterior vessels. But as, as soon as you cut completely the posterior aspect of the tibia with or without the key wire, and we test them in the mechanical settings and we publish this, you have no reason to have an increased stress in the middle of your tibia. Everything will follow the key wire and the key wire will bend, absorb, but you will have nothing happening on the medial aspect of the tibia on the central aspect of the tibia. Okay, so another question about the hinge K wire. How far proximal should the hinge K wire go? Should it be just short of the articular surface? What happens if you accidentally, you know, take it through the articular surface? What happens then? Uh, it's a good point. Uh, uh, just imagine you don't have any PSI because the, this, this is also something that we raised with, uh, with uh, Chris, Christian and Adrian. Uh, if you don't have any PSI, it's almost impossible to shoot your key wire from distal to proximal because the direction is insane and you, don't, you have no control of the anterior posterior position. So the easiest way to do that is to do a small incision just above the fibula head and to shoot it proximal to distal. And so I'm doing that when I'm not using my P the PSI for many reasons because today I'm maybe doing 17% of my cases with PSI, but I'm leaving the simple one, I'm doing it freehand. So uh, when I'm doing freehand, I'm shooting this key wire from outside to inside, and it changed nothing in terms of complication or whatever it can happen. But uh, in the other hand, it's a very good tool to have 
And this is what we are doing when we do femur, for example. We are shooting him from outside to inside or from proximal to distal. And it's changing nothing in terms of uh, uh, what, what this key wire can bring you in terms of stability and uh, resistance to fracture. Okay, the next question is that, uh, you know, we're all concerned about weight bearing. So what will be your recommendations be to allow full weight bearing or protected weight bearing? If you have used a PSI, if you have not used a PSI, if you used an active motion plate, size one plate, size two plate, can you, be, can you elaborate a bit more on the weight bearing protocol? Okay. Yes, yes, uh, it's, it's a big concern because it's one of the uh, bad points of osteotomy. If you said to your patient, it's an on weight bearing scenario for two months, everybody will run out of the, of the clinic, of course. So I think with a locket plate, with uh, an osteotomy, which is not crazy, like let's say imagine a maximum to 10 to 11 degree correction, with an adequate uh, uh, um, filling of the gap, which is in my mind, holographed only, um, full weight bearing, three hour after the surgery, okay. without any crutches or whatever. In any kind of scenario where this patient are overweighted, uh, not gra non grafted for any reason, or I'm afraid of any fracture, first, I will switch to a size two, because it's more rigid. Second, I will do partial weight bearing for three, month, three weeks. If I have inch fracture, overweight, tobacco users or thing like that, I'm non-weight bearing for some days because I don't want shitty things to happen. But in all other cases, it's outpatient, full weight bearing day zero. Perfect. Uh, can you apply the same PSI technology for the femur as well? And if so, what sort of PSI surgery can you do? Can you do a medial closing wedge femur, a lateral opening wedge femur? I would say you can do whatever you want as long as there is a plate designed for it. Because it's, I mean, the, the concept is not the PSI itself. The real concept is how you can create a mathematical model that connects holes to correction so to do that you need to have a plate and i know that philippe which is uh, which is connected is working on ankle wrist shoulder elbow uh, uh, knee proximal hip whatever so the only the only question is do you have a plate for that in in your portfolio and knowing well nuclear portfolio i think they got a plate for everything perfect so the next question that I want to ask you is that with the use of the PSI, do you think you can move your osteotomy a lot more proximal in the tibia and thereby, you know, you can get rid of the requirement to do a biplanar osteotomy? We, yeah, yes, of course, of course. If, I mean, the biplanar osteotomy, in my mind, I'm only, always doing biplanar because I was... Uh, it, because it was my learning and, and everybody told me all along my, my medical studies that to, I should do a biplanner. So I'm focused on my planner. But, um, but yes, the PSI can be moved a little bit higher if you want it with a more horizontal cut if you want it. Once again, the, the only thing is you need to have a plate. And second, if you want to have it pink, they will do it pink for you. I promise. If you want to have Perfect. no key wire, three, four, Eight Kiwari, they can do it for you. The only question is, why do you want this kind of specificity? And once again, I can I can probably try to find a, a, I can try probably try to find a, a, an image of what my new my, my actual PSI is looking like. Give me just a second. But I mean, the, the, it's shape it's shape changed a lot in the last years, just because uh, we we want to we, we want to get rid of those. Uh, a consideration of um, of uh, of um, releasing the the, PC, the MCL, uh, cutting uh, uh, the hamstrings, and, and so on and so on. So uh, we we switch we switch to more uh, to we, we change a lot our way to design and to 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 construct our PSI just because it's it's so adaptable. So yeah, I, got, I I will try to to share my screen. And you Perfect. So, yeah. So while the image is coming up, there's another question. And the question is, oh, 
Okay, perfect. I'll get you to show this to us and then I'll ask the next question there. So as you can see, first generation, anterior bracket, posterior bracket, screws. This is an ACL uh, cutting guide too. And this is the new one. So my actual one is like five centimeter globally, only an anterior bracket, nothing behind. So I can plug it onto the MCL and I got some very, only, only two screw distals and everything is very small. So I can put it in under the, the MIS uh, consideration, and uh, but at the same time, you need to control how you plug it in terms of rotation because of course mistake are, are will happen easily because you got nothing to, to to position behind of the knee behind of the tibia. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great new technique I think, and we'll be looking forward to that as well. Uh, the next question comes from Dr. Sama, who poses a question, uh, something that you did allude to in your uh, presentation. So if there's a young patient, say 45 years old with uh, varus, and he has a normal mechanical LDFA and an MPTA with isolated medial compartment arthritis. So it's a post meniscectomy situation with a varus knee would you consider an osteotomy or would you not? Because if you do an osteotomy, would the JLCA be sort of be altered or really go into an abnormal alignment because now you're changing a normal mechanical LDFA and an MPTA? Very good question. Uh, once again, uh, uh, um, I would say we are in, a, I hope I will not meet too many patients in this case scenario because I mean, this guy is young. There is no good answer. We are in, in, a, in so-called salvage procedure because the real answer is unicompatible knee arthroplasty. But nobody wants to, want to do this kind of surgery at 25. So the idea is to promote, to have a tool which is give you uh, ability to enhance cartilage healing, let's say, uh, uh, probably unload a, a, a suffering joint compartment. And I would say today I will do an osteotomy, a very small one. My minimum is five degree. I will never put a plate uh, and, and take all the risk that, that are connected to an osteotomy if I'm not correcting at least five degree of angulation. But probably tomorrow I will do a distraction. And uh, I think the world will uh, discover and, and, and this kind of technique will be spread uh, uh, following uh, Ronald Van Leeuwarden publication and everything. If you just read the literature, it looks awesome. I mean, two months of distractor, whatever it is, how, whatever it's an external fixator, whatever, and, and they, they get patient pain free for five years. I mean, this is probably the good option, but I don't have any experience on that. But let's do the same question in two years in Pune, and I will try to answer with something else, okay? But today okay. I would say minimal osteotomy, probably holograft, because it will give me some, something to put inside of the space, except if there is a very bad arthritis, because we all know that it's not working. And then a minimal, minimal osteotomy. Once again, patient don't want to be with a very abnormal limb morphology. And if you try to play with tools and put them into a plus 10 degrees of valgus, they will help you for that because they are not solving any problem and they will, it will be very painful and not comfortable for them to be like this. Perfect. Thank you so much for that lovely answer. How, how can you apply the principles of PSI for dealing with a malunited tibial head fracture? So you have an upper end of the tibia that was fixed or it was not fixed. It's malunited. So how, how do you plan for, you know, doing an osteotomy and how to use the PSI in such technology, in such situations? Can you walk us through that? Of course, of course. Yeah. Same thing. So it's the, the problem will be today that uh, you need the plate. And so working in the fracture of, or post-fracture scenario with an astronomy plate is not so easy because the screw direction is not designed to, to play with that. Then two questions, lateral compartment with uh, let's say a depression of the, the tibial plateau. I will go for a, an Eric Johnson surgery, for example. So I will completely open the tibia 
uh, through the Gerdy tubercle and try to elevate everything from inside. Medial compartment with, for example, posterior medial fragment that are still uh, 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 away from the normal uh, position. I will do uh, uh, probably not a PSI because once again, I don't have the experience, but what I'm doing is uh, a procline position, uh, a big opening, posterior opening, re-breaking re everything and putting some uh, uh, trauma plating like Sintis or Strike or whatever, because we, we, you need to have more than just a, a support of a, an ideal fracture. You need to have a support for a, a, an anatomical uh, a mistake uh, created by your fracture. So I will say, you can do it with a PSI. You can do some Shiba osteotomy. You can do some uh, elevation osteotomy. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. You need to think about which plate I want to use with it because it's, the PSI is connected to a plate. But at the end, the problem is, uh, uh, will it be enough to have an osteotomy plate? If yes, PSI exists for this kind of concept and I can share with you or anybody some slide because we are doing a lot of those kind of cases with, uh, with new clip and, and osteotomy plate too. But think about it, do an osteotomy plate will be enough for my surgery. This is the first step. Yeah, perfect. So that's a great answer, I think. And uh, that sort of clears up a lot of concepts uh, with the same. Have you used a PSI for an osteotomy along with a PCL reconstruction? Because that seems to be the more difficult one. So have you done a concomitant osteotomy along with a PCL reconstruction? And have you used the PSI to come to your rescue for that? Uh, I didn't. To be honest, I didn't. Not yet probably will be uh, for posterior lateral uh, chronic instability, I think. Uh, and, but I know that uh, Philippe designed a femoral tunnel uh, PSI aimer for a PCL reconstruction associated with a femoral osteotomy. So I think we have this in the portfolio if you want it, uh, but I didn't. So yes, the problem will be uh, how to get this uh, posterior tibial tunnel, I think, uh, the good spot. Uh, 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 without touching my, my, my more posterior screws. To be honest, I think it's feasible. Uh, but yes, of course, the tunnel will be very distal and it's not the same cases. We need to think about it because probably the plate will be too short. Okay, thank you. So I think, uh, Matthew, I think uh, your presentation has been crystal clear and uh, we've answered a lot of questions that had come through on the chat box. We've had a fantastic discussion. I think uh, it's always a great pleasure to hear you because every time I hear you speak, I go home with, with uh, more learning myself. So uh, thank you for this <laughs> lovely can. presentation. And I'll hand it over to Greg for his closing comments. And uh, we will look at, uh, we will see what Greg has to speak. Well, uh, I, will add, I, will, I have nothing in particular to add except that uh, and uh, thanking you uh, Mathieu and Sachin, I guess that uh, moderating the session was a fantastic experience for all of, all of us uh, uh, with you, Sachin, because uh, you have given us a, um, a specific flavor uh, during uh, that uh, uh, session. Thanks again, uh, Mathieu, for okay. this extensive presentation. And I would like to thank in particular all the attendees uh, for this uh, great moment all together. So thank you so much. Have a great evening to everybody. And we another appointment for next week where we'll speak in particular uh, where Mathieu Olivier and Christian Clay will speak in particular uh, about the double level osteotomy. You are all, all uh, more than welcome to, to join us uh, next uh, Tuesday. Sachin, Mathieu, thanks again for, for your Thank time you. and for that fantastic performance. Thank, Thank you. you everybody. Thank you Sachin. You were the best moderator I ever had. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. In, a, in a webinar. In a webinar. <laughs> Sachin, you're a gentleman. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Thank folks. You Bye. Everybody, stay safe. Take care of you.